All right, we are now recording. Let's get the slideshow set up from the current slide. And let me make these first couple of announcements uh, before we move on. First, the math team still meeting every Monday afternoon at 3 o'clock over in Birmingham West Campus. Uh, the uh, science building, C building, uh, and C100. And then again on Friday at noon uh, with Mr. Rossi. And you're welcome to come. Uh, have we been sort of fun times? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. You learned some math too, don't you? Yeah, good deal. And I told you the tutoring schedules on both campuses, uh, especially for the Space Center, but they also have tutoring in the SSS labs as well. They pay pretty good prices on this, and you are prime candidates to tutor because you've had uh, more math than just about anyone else here. Who do you talk to about that? Um, just down the hall here uh, in the Student Support Services lab. The lab is at 202, but I think you probably have to go around the corner uh, to 212, Miss uh, with Sharon Harris. And uh, she's in an office and it has student support services over the door. It's the last office on the right before you get to the restrooms. And uh, so she's, uh, she's really good. Uh, there's another person you might be able to talk with, Miss Cicely Martin, is an instructor who tutors in there. And she's, as you go down the hall past the second exit before you get to the corner to turn left, uh, her office is right next to 205. Uh, yeah, and uh, just past 205, it doesn't have a, a number on it. But, but she might be able to, to help with that as well. I don't know who's doing the scheduling, if it's Ms. Harris or Ms. Martin. I think it's probably Ms. Harris. Used to be Ms. Holland's in there, but I think she took another job somewhere and they haven't replaced her yet. Um, hello, I tutored in English. When I first started at Lawson State, and like you have to get like the recommendation letters and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't think you have any problem getting those. Okay. <laughs> Since they'll probably be asking me, so <laughs> yeah. I haven't had you for a class before this one, right? But uh, I've seen how you performed in here. Okay, and then the one other announcement. I swear it's been a long time since I've been on the Birmingham Cat. Well, actually, I was there one Friday, uh, on Friday, but this Friday, I've got a doctor's appointment. This time, it's not with my hematologist, it's my annual physical, and uh, I just happened to come now. So, uh, next Friday, I think I'll be there, <laughs> okay? But this Friday, I will not. I might be there later, I don't know for sure, because I've got a uh, They've called a meeting for some time that Friday. I haven't seen the time, and if the doctor's appointment get over, gets over with the time, I may head to campus and make that meeting, but then I'll be in a meeting, so I wouldn't be available anyway. Okay. Any other questions before we get going today? I'll even turn on the projector for you today. Y'all been pretty good. So turn on the projector. Now, the screen you see come up says applications of differentiation. Uh, we actually have one more example to do at the end of section 2.5, and uh, this is chapter 3, but I need some white space to work on. That probably is going to give me about as much as anything. So let's do example 8 at the bottom, uh, if there are no questions on other things bottom of two of 148 okay finding a tangent line to a graph find the tangent line to the graph of here's the function let me get my pen set up okay all right here's the function x squared times my pen's not writing well okay squared plus y squared is equal to y squared 
at the point root 2 over 2 root 2 over 2. Okay, as shown in the figure. And that's the thing that sort of irritates me that this text, whereas the other text I've used from this author and publisher, always put the figures in here. And this one does not. Even on the ones they're not showing, you know, doing the work on, they still show the figures, and this one doesn't. So sorry about that. Basically, this is a function that looks. Uh, it actually has a name. It's called the Kappa Curve. Uh, never run into that before. Uh, but Isaac Barra, I think we mentioned him last time, he was instrumental in uh, defining and, and working with this curve. Um, the interesting thing is it shows that it has vertical asymptotes Trying for the life of me to figure out why that's true. At negative one and one. Say again? At negative one and one, yeah. Um, I guess if you had a two for x, that would be two squared, it would be four times four plus y squared. Okay, I guess this is, okay, look at it this way. Uh, don't want to get too bogged down on it. We'll take their word for it. But that's the graph. Both of you have your books so you can see it, so I'm not going to bother drawing it. But what I do do is always check to verify that point is indeed on that graph. What is... room and the air handling <clears throat> but hard to see so anyway that point is on the curve so we can proceed so how are we going to find uh, the tangent line to that graph at that point what are we going to need to do Thank you. Ah, very good choice okay and what would that be ah here's Harrison So what, okay, now, time out here. How do you propose that we take the derivative here? You have a couple of options. What are the options that you see? The product rule or the chain rule. Okay, uh, certainly the product rule is a possibility, and you're going to use the chain rule in whichever you use, but what I was, uh, I guess, kind of implying is you can either multiply, distribute the x squared across, and then not use a product rule, <clears throat> or you can use the product rule. You're going to use the chain rule in either case. So which do you want to use? Distribute. Distribute? Okay. So what would be your first step? Uh, x squared. Which is? x to the fourth plus, plus x squared right is equal to y squared right okay now what next 
And again, you have a, a couple of kind of choices. I don't want to suggest the next one because I think it will make things messier. So what would you do next? Take a derivative, okay? And what would that be? 4x four four X cubed plus 2x. Nope. Here you do have to use product rule. You took the derivative of the first times y squared plus to y one more little term there not yet he said See, y is a function of x. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why, yeah. And what will that give? Okay. Okay, I'm going to put y prime because I started right. Yeah, dy dx would be fine. It would be, okay. Product rule for this part is the derivative of the first times the second like you did, plus the first times the derivative of the second. The first is x squared. The derivative of the second is 2y, y prime, or 2y dy dx. So I put the 2 out front, and that goes there. Now we put the equal sign, and what do we have on the right-hand side? Two y, 2y, y prime again. Very good. Okay, here's Nakoma. Okay. Now what? Get the y primes together. So what would you how do you do that? Say again? Yeah, uh, subtract 2x squared y, y prime from both sides. So you get all the y primes on one side, all the terms without y prime on the other side. So minus 2x squared y, y prime. Okay? These then go away. Do you rather have the y primes on the left or right? Does it matter? Okay, we'll leave them where they are then. This would be a 4x cubed plus 2xy squared is equal to 3 says extreme of a function. We're not doing that right now. We're doing example 8, bottom of page 148, the last exercise in 2.5, which is the last section we're going to do in chapter 2. So uh, that's where we are. That's what we're doing. Um, so what do we have on the right? Two y. 2y y prime minus 2x squared y, y prime. Okay. I probably should have done this earlier, but we'll do it now. What's one thing obvious you can do right now? Divide by y? Yeah, divide, well, I wouldn't divide by y. I divide by 2. Make that a 2, 1, 1, and 1. Why hang around, you know, haul around a bunch of numbers that you don't need? Okay. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Every term was had a two in it, divide them away. Okay? Now, I think what Harrison was getting at is factor out 
a y. Is that what you're? Yeah. Factor out a y over here. Uh, no, actually, factor out the y prime over here and leave you just other terms. So this will be with the new coefficients 2x cubed plus xy squared is equal to. I'm going to bring the y prime out front. y prime times y minus x squared y. Okay? Now what? Yes, divide by that coefficient, you might say, the binomial term, y minus x squared y, both sides, y minus x squared y, okay? And they go out here. So now you have your y prime. That's what Clark was wanting at the first place. He wanted to take a derivative. We've done it. What do we do with it? Plug in what? Yeah, the point values. Root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. So your y prime at root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, is going to be all right let's do it two now what is root two over two cubed Okay, it's one half because that was root two over two squared times a root two over two. Right? Okay. You got it? Okay. Plus, we're doing the numerator here x, which is root two over two, times y squared, but y is also root 2 over 2, so that's by another 1 half, okay, over, and the y down here is a root 2 over 2, minus the x squared is a 1 half, and the y is a root 2 over 2. Okay, surely this is going to simplify somehow, some way here. Okay. Well, first and foremost, we can get rid of the, a 2 there. So this gives us y prime at that point. Is equal to numerator root 2 over 2 I'm going to factor that out and leave me a 1 plus 1 half which is going to be 3 halves you see what I did is root 2 over 2 in both of those down here there's also a root 2 over 2 in both terms so I'm going to factor that out and leaves me a 1 minus 1 half Right? Well, the good news is root 2 over 2 over root 2 over 2 is 1. All right. That's taken care of. So this is going to be 3 halves over 1 half, which is what? Three. 3. That looks to be the slope. Looking at the graph in your text looks pretty good to me. Okay? Okay, we got the slope. You happy now? What do we do with it? What are we looking for? That wasn't what the problem was. Find the slope of the uh, tangent line at the point. It says find the tangent line to the graph at that point. Exactly. So you have y minus, and your y1 is? root 2 over 2 is equal to 3 times 
x minus root 2 over 2. All right. Uh, let's see what we can do to that one. y minus root 2 over 2 is equal to 3x minus 3 root 2 over 2 and then add a root 2 over 2 to both sides. All right. Running out of room. Okay. Uh, y is equal to 3x. All right. Um, I'm going to do a little sleight of hand here. Okay, what I'm going to do on this thing is, okay, that's the 3x is there. y is equal to 3x. That's up there. Okay. And I'm going to put this in front because it's a plus, that's minus. I like pluses better. Okay? To lead off it. So I'm going to factor out a root 2 over 2 again. And what we have is a 1 minus 3, which is a negative 2, right? So that's going to be a root 2 over 2. Seems like we've used this trick several times in this problem. Times 1 minus 3, okay, which is a negative 2. So it's y is equal to 3x minus, and the 2, this will be a minus 2. The 2's divide away. And it's minus root 2 over 2. No, I'm sorry, root 2. I factored out or divided out the denominator. Sorry about that. Okay. One, root 3. 3x minus root 2. I think I got it right. Let's, let me go back and review. Yeah, looks like that's right. Let's see what the book got. Y is equal to 3x minus root 2. Good for them. Okay. A lot of that was just busy work with algebra. Okay. Really, sometimes the, algebra, the calculus part's the easy part, and then the algebra part's the harder part. Yeah. And this did have plenty of weirdness to it, but got the right answer. Now, they probably went about it a different way. Uh, for instance, just writing down the answer rather than telling you how they got it. Uh, but I tried to show you at least one way to get it. I don't know if it's the best way, but it's the way that made sense to me. Any questions on that? Sorry uh, I get sort of wadded up, but I have just so much space to work with with the screen here. And uh, so it does get a little cramped. Make sense? All right, that finishes uh, a section 2.5. There is a concept check there. Basically, it's asking you to review definitions and, and uh, uh, restate things in your own words. I'll let you do that on your own. Then, homework exercises. Uh, I've given these mostly before. Any of the odds, 5 through 19, all those are at calpchat.com. Fives at calpview.com. Either 21 or 23, they're both at Calp Chat. Uh, 23 is at Calp View. Any of the odds, uh, 25 to 31, they're all at Calp Chat. 25 is at Calp View. Either 33 or 35, they're both at Calp Chat. 33 is at Calp View. Uh, Either 37, I'm sorry, any of the odds, 37 to 41, they're, all three of those are at Calp Chat, 39 to Calp View. Then there's an exploring concepts, which is writing some stuff down, so you can certainly do that if you'd like. The next actual problem, though, would be 45. It's only at Calp Chat. Uh, it has two parts to it. 47 is at both Calp Chat and Calp View. Uh, any of the odds 49 to 53, they're all three at Calp Chat. 53 is at Calp View. B, 
255, that's that cap chat. Uh, do 57, it's a cap chat. Then it's sort of a think through a problem. 59, it I think should be a cap chat as well. 61 should be a cap chat. Either 63 or 65, both of those are a cap chat. And 67 is a cap chat. Okay. 69 then is sort of an application. Orthogonal trajectories, uh, it should be at Calp Chat, as should 71. 73 is a proof. You're certainly welcome to do that if you'd like. It should be at Calp Chat as well, and 79 is another tangent line problem like we just did. And then there's a normal line problem that sort of takes it another step, so you're certainly welcome to look at that if you'd like. And then uh, there's a section project if you're interested in doing that. All right. Unfortunately, we don't have time for the related rates, which is 2.6. They're great, sort of fun things to do, but we're just running a bit uh, behind time. Elijah came in. Anyone else? I think I got everybody else. Okay. So we're not going to do example... I mean, section 2.8, 2.6, but you're certainly welcome to look at those. They are, like I said, fairly fun problems to do. I wish we had time for them, but we really need to move on. If we finish the rest of the stuff, we'll try to come back and do that. All right, now, the review exercises at the end of the chapter after 2.6 related rates and some of those, if you need a few more to work on, the odds, again, are at count chat. None of these are at count for you. So you can do either one or three if you choose, five, seven, any of the odds, nine through 19, any of the odds, 21 to either 21 or 23, 25, 27, any of the odds, 29 to 39, any uh, either 41 or 43, any of the odds 45 to 51, 53, any of the odds 55 to 65, uh, any of the odds 67 to 71, 73 or 75 or both, uh, any of the odds, okay, I think that's where we stop because the rest of those, I believe, are related rates. All right, good deal. There's also a problem-solving um, blurb here on page 163 and 164. Certainly, if it's of interest to you, proceed with it, okay? All right. Uh, here is a term you seldom see anymore. Uh, going to step back a moment and get to remember, if you have a displacement, the first root of the displacement is, with respect to time, is velocity. And the first root of the velocity with respect to time is? Acceleration. Terrell is here. And very seldom do you see this, but the first derivative with respect to acceleration has nothing to do with Terrell walking in, but it's called the jerk. No, I'm sorry. I mean, literally, that's what it's called. Nothing to do with you coming in. Okay? Uh, and that's in example 15 in those uh, uh, problem solving, which is. You usually don't see that outside of a physics class, and quite often not even in physics. So, all right, that was just sort of fancy. Let me clear this. Any questions on chapter two? And since we're here, let me go on and pass out. Maybe I'll just pass out. We'll pass out the chapter two test.
Okay? Again, it's only one page. Sorry about that. And it's probably way too easy. Sorry about that as well. And I hope all of you have turned in the first half, right? I still got yours? Okay. It's a good idea to get those in. Not a good idea to have them piled up. So please try to get those in. Oh! Yes, I should have made this as an announcement too. Uh, I'm not really worried about this class, but they do. Uh, and I, I guess y'all realize last week, uh, Monday of last week, one week ago today, was midterm. I think I may have said it was midnight Saturday or something, but it wasn't. It was actually Monday. Okay, midnight Monday night was the middle of the term. So we're right at the end of the first week in the second mini term. So midterm is over. Okay? Sometimes they ask for us to do a midterm progress report, which means we have to report any students who have D's or F's at midterm. And if they do do this and I have no grades, then I have to report that you have an F at midterm. Okay? Now you have several possibilities of grades. Your research paper, hint, hint, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. A third of the class has turned in a research paper, so you had a pretty decent score there. Um, and then your first test, it's been basically about a month that you've had that, uh, so that's another potential score. And then you just got this one. So I should have a score from each one of you, but I think some of you I don't. So please get me. Uh, either your research paper, I want the first test too, but uh, good deal. The research paper would be a good thing to turn in anytime you can as well. Okay, so if they do open it up and say turn in the midterm progress reports, I won't have to, I can just say all done, none, none for this class, okay. That's the easiest thing for me to do, so please. Yeah. All right, any questions before I move on? Any on chapter two? I'm going to click. Yes. When is, you just need the paper due anytime. It's anytime. Um, just as a reminder, um, you have more time now than you will have at the end of the term. Right. It's technically not due till the last day of class, but I encourage you to get it in sooner. And I also encourage that with a little bit of bonus. Uh, you, I think, got three bonus points if you turned it in the month of January. That's over with. Two bonus points if you turned it in the month of February. That's over with. But you still get one bonus point if you get it in the month of March. If you get it, turn it in the month of April, you get your score. But there's no bonus. Okay? So that's another little incentive for trying to get those in sooner rather than later. Okay. And you... Get moving on it because guess what? We have class this week and next week. And then what awful thing happens? Spring break, yeah. Terrible. You know, we'll miss seeing you for an entire week. I don't know how I'll manage, but okay. I would say how you would manage, but I'm not going to ask that question. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning of chapter 3. This is applications of differentiation. Okay? Uh, 3.1 is the first of these. And by the way, this is one reason we moved on. Look at how many sections are in chapter 3. Nine sections. Now, I think we probably won't do all those, but there's a bunch of them here. Okay? 3.1 is extrema of an inter on an interval. Okay, that's going to require just a little bit of talking what we mean by that, but basically you've already done the grunt work on it, it's just refining it. Well, the objections here are to understand the definition of an extrema of a function on an interval. Understand the definition of a relative extrema of a function on an open interval. And find the extrema on a closed interval. Okay? Uh, several words there. I don't know if you're uh, 
know the difference between an open and a closed interval? You probably do, but if you don't, that's pretty easy. And then the, what in the world do we mean by an extrema? By the way, this all comes from, I think, Greek. The plural in Greek is the letter A, and the singular is usually U-M, but we don't usually talk about an extremum. We talk of maximum or a minimum, ending in U-M, singular. If there's more than one, maxima or minima. Okay, that's Greek plural. Alumni, alum, you know, that kind of stuff. So let's start with talking what in the world do we mean by the extreme of a function. In calculus, much effort is devoted to determining the behavior of a function on some interval i. Okay, so from now on when you see the letter i that indicates some interval. The question is, does f have a maximum value on that interval i? Does it have a minimum value? Guess what? Those are your extreme values, maximum or minimum, okay? Where is the function increasing, okay? Where is the function decreasing? Guess what? Your derivatives tell you these answers pretty much. In this chapter, you will learn how derivatives can be used to answer all of those questions, all four of those questions right there. You will also see why these questions are important in some real life applications. Okay? So here's the definition of an extrema, of extrema. If f is some function on some interval i containing some value c. So, uh, now, it's not f that contains, i contains that value c. So i extends from somewhere over here, c is somewhere in there, and i extends to over here. So c is somewhere in that interval i. Okay? Now, f of c then, f of some point inside that interval, is the minimum of f on i when f of c, when you plug that value in for into your function, when f of c is less than or equal to all the other f of x's, the y values, for all those x's on that interval i. Okay? So if, if the function is going along like this, okay, the very lowest point there, there's your minimum value. Now you may have had others that are at the same value, that are less than or equal to, but nothing is ever less than alpha c. Okay? Alpha c is a maximum on that interval, i, when alpha c is greater than or equal to all the other alpha of x, all the other y values, or all x's on that interval i. So that would mean that you had some value there. If that's greater than or equal to all the rest of the y values here, that's the maximum value. And again, you could have several others that are equal to it, uh, but that would be a maximum value. The maxim, minimum and maximum values of a function on an interval are the extreme values or extrema. The singular form of extrema is extremum, which we very seldom use. Uh, we use maximum and minimum, singular, but you could use maxima or minima if you had more than one, okay? But we usually use extrema for the plural, very seldom use extremum, you could, uh, of the function on that interval. The minimum and maximum values of the function on the interval are also called the absolute minimum and the absolute maximum. That value that nothing else exceeds or gets less than uh, these are, and these are called the absolute maximum or minimum or the global absolute maximum, global minimum or global maximum on that interval. Extrema can occur at interior points or at the endpoints of the interval. Okay? Extrema that occur at the endpoints are called Endpoint extrema. Lots of terminology here. After a while, and you're used to it, 
it makes pretty much sense, okay? But it might take a little getting used to, okay? A function need not have a minimum or a maximum on an interval. Seems like that would be weird not to have one or the other. Uh, for instance, in these figures that are coming up, A and B here, uh, you can see that the function f of x equal x squared plus 1 has both a minimum and a maximum value on the closed interval minus 1 to positive 2. Closed means that value is in the interval. Minus 1 is in the interval, so the value of f of minus 1, when you plug in a minus 1 there, that would give you 2. And over here at 2, that would give you 5. 5 is actually the absolute maximum, or the maximum value on that interval. The minimum value is this one down here at 0, 1. Okay? That's a parabola. The vertex is the minimum value. Okay? All right. That's the closed interval. F is a continuous function. On that closed interval, and you include the inputs. However, if you had an open interval, negative 1 to 2, looks just like this, except now the inputs are not included. So here you had a bracket, meaning you were including the inputs. Here you have a parenthesis saying you're not including the inputs. Okay? And since this was your maximum before, this function doesn't have a maximum because that import is not included. You might say, well, how about 1.9999999? Wouldn't that be a maximum? No, 1.9999999999 would be a little bit greater. And since you can't define the import to, you, you don't ever get there, you can get ever closer and closer and closer and each one of those values would be greater than the one before. So this one does not have a maximum. Still has a minimum, uh, but this endpoint isn't defined either. Oh, well, it's, the endpoint is there, but it's not included on the, it's an open interval. So you wouldn't include that. Okay, so that's what they meant by it doesn't have to have both a minimum and a maximum. Most of the time it'll have one or the other. Not always, okay? But it doesn't have to have both. For a closed interval, yeah, it's going to have one of these. Well, there are some unusual functions that might not. But if it's a continuous function, uh, you usually do have either a minimum or maximum. Closed interval, you have both. <coughs> Open interval, you may not have. In fact, a straight line like this, okay? Open, open, it doesn't have a maximum or minimum. Okay, close it would, but uh, yeah, so you may not have either one of them, in fact. All right, moreover, in figure 31C, you see that the continuity or lack of it can affect the extrema, the existence of an extrema on the interval, okay? So if you had a discontinuous function, as defined by a piecewise defined function, with Chris Cheston here, get you in the right block here. Is anyone else come in since I'll go? Okay. Um, that would influence. So here's your function. G of x is that x squared plus 1. For all values except x equals 0, x equals 0, it happens to have a value of 2. Okay? Now, there's a limit down here, but the function is not equal to the limit here. The function value is there. Okay? Well, that would have a maximum because you have a closed interval here. You would not have a minimum, though, because what was your minimum before has been redefined up here. And again, these values here, the closer you get to zero from either the left or right, the closer you get to one, but you never reach it. 
So therefore, you have a maximum without a minimum. Okay? So, here's the extreme value theorem. If f is continuous, this one's not continuous. But f, if f is continuous on any closed interval a to b, then f has both a minimum and a maximum on that level, on that interval. Okay? Now, the one function that is sort of problematic here would be a constant function. Okay? A constant function that constant value is both the minimum and the maximum, and it is everywhere. So that doesn't really sound like that is a continuous function. Closed interval uh, is minimum and maximum would be the same value. In fact, every value would be the same. That is the only one that seems like it's a bug in this one, okay? But the rest of these, if it is a continuous function, it, on a closed interval, it's guaranteed to have a minimum or maximum. Min both a minimum and a maximum. Okay. They have a little expl exploration here uh, at the bottom of page 166. Goodness gracious. <laughs> Running out of energy. I had a treatment Friday and it seems like every day getting tireder and tireder. And this happened the first time I had this drug. Uh, and probably has happened every time. But boy, I had more energy Saturday than I did yesterday. And then I have more energy yesterday than I feel like I have today. But we'll make it through. Okay. Uh, good to look at that exploration. I think you'll see some uh, pretty good stuff there. So, relative extrema and critical numbers. Another terminology thing. All right. In figure 3.2, which is at the top of page 167, if you do have your text, uh, in figure 3.2, which is here, uh, the graph of f of x equal x cubed minus 3x squared has a relative maximum at the point zero, zero. Now here's another new term, a relative maximum, okay? And it has a relative minimum down here at two negative four, okay? I believe if you had math 112, you did some of these. I'm not, I'm pretty sure we call them relative minimum and maximum then, but uh, it, this is nothing new for you. Is there, are these absolute maxima or minima? Extrema? Not unless you contain the uh, uh, interval to, uh, to be something. Uh, if you say ended it over here at negative 0.5, and then at it over here at, say, 2.5, yeah, that would be extreme maximum, extreme ma minimum, okay? But if you let it go on, this is going south and never stopping, and this is going north and never stopping. So, no, neither of these would be extreme values, but they'd be relative minimum and relative maximum. So there's a new term for you. And formally, for a continuous function, you can either think of a relative maximum as occurring on a hill of the graph and a relative minimum as occurring in the valley of the graph. Okay? Good way to think of it graphically. Okay. Now, what does that mean? On some interval close to the x value here, close to x equals zero, all the f of x's in here are less than or equal to the f of x at that point. For it to be a relative maximum. For it to be a relative minimum, uh, for all values close to, in this case, x equal 2, uh, all of your other x values close to that would have values greater than or equal to your negative 4. So that would be a relative minimum. Okay? 
valleys and hills work pretty well too. Any questions on that? So here they sort of threw in a new term for you, relative active relative minimum, uh, but they're pretty clear what they would be. Okay. Such a hill and a valley can occur in two ways. Now they're calling them hills and valleys. When the hill or valley is smooth and rounded, the graph has a horizontal tangent line at the high point or the low point. If it's a smooth, rounded graph, okay? We're already assuming they're continuous. Now they're saying not just continuous, but smooth. When the hill or the valley is sharp, or peaked, or cusped, or something like that, the graph represents a function that is not differentiable at that point. Because the derivative coming in this way is not the same as the derivative going out that way, because remember, for it to be, uh, a for the derivative to exist, the, the left hand and right hand limits must be the same. And there they would not be for the derivative. You also have cusps, you have points that go up like that. Can't be that, or that go down like that. Okay. So those are not differentiable at the high point or the low point. You still have them at relative minimum or maximum, but they're not differentiable there. If they're smooth and rounded, then the horizontal tangent, uh, uh, the graph of that has a horizontal tangent line, meaning a slope of zero. Okay, so horizontal tangent line slope zero. So here's the definition of relative extrema. We are talking about basically extrema before, now we got to the term relative. If there is an open interval containing C, C is in the interval I, containing C for which F of C is a maximum in that interval, then F is called a relative maximum for of F. And you can say that F has a relative maximum at C, F of C. F can be doing all sorts of things outside that, but if there's some interval around C where that is a maximum, then that's going to be a relative maximum for F. If there's an open interval containing C, for which f of c is a minimum, then f of c is called a relative minimum for all of f. You can say that f of c has a relative minimum at c of c. Notice we always give your points in ordered pairs. x, f of x, x, y, okay? c, f of c, x, y. The plural of a relative maximum is a relative, is relative maxima, the plural of relative minimum is relative minima, and the, I'm going to sound like, it. no, we won't go there. Relative maximum and relative minimum are sometimes called the local maximum or the local minimum, respectively. In other words, in some local location, that's as high as you can go, or that's as low as you can go. That's a, a hill or a valley. All right, here is example one. Bottom of page 167. Find the value of the derivative at each of the relative extremum shown here. Okay? Value of the derivative. Here's a function, rather strange function. f of x is equal to 9 times x squared minus 3 over x cubed. Okay? They tell you 3, 0, 3, 2 is a relative maximum. Okay? Point where 2 is as high as this goes anywhere on either side of x equals 3. Okay? So find the value of the derivative. Okay. Tell you what it is, ignore that, you do it yourself. Okay? How would you find that derivative? f prime of x. What would you do? OK, 
Okay, it looks like a good candidate for a quotient rule. And how does that go? Say again? X cubed times Okay, yeah. Low D high. So that would be X cubed times Okay, but you got a 9 in front of it. That'd be an 18x. Okay, the rest of the terms are thing. Okay, minus. Nine times x squared minus three. That's high. Three x squared. There's your d low over low low. X to the sixth x cubed squared okay there's your first root well we can do a little bit to clean that up for instance the first oh goodness gracious i just want to lie down and go to bed okay 18 x to the fourth minus okay i'm going distribute oh wait two times x squared times three x squared no is that a two yeah it is no it isn't that's a nine okay my pen kind of drags on me sometime okay that's a little clear it's a nine x squared times a three x squared that would be minus 27 x to the fourth and then you have a minus nine times a minus three that's plus twenty seven times another three that's plus eighty one x squared okay over x to the sixth well obviously you can take out an x squared leaving you and x to the fourth here that goes completely this leaves you an x squared and that leaves you an x squared i divide it out just because why hell around all these big uh exponents when you can get rid of a few of them okay hmm. now said find the value at each relative derivative at each relative extremum they told you what the relative extremum is what I'm going to do is do it the other way if this is a nice smooth curve what do we say is going to be true about the tangent at the uh, maximum or minimum horizontal line What's the derivative of that? Zero. So we're going to set that equal to zero. Okay? So that's what we're going to do is set it equal to zero. Now, uh, <laughs> I'm telling you that is the value of it. It's going to be zero, and that's why they tell you down here too. Uh, so that's when x... Well, we're going to set that equal to zero. Okay. Now, the only way this expression, I'm going to write it down again. Goodness, it's leaving marks on the page. Okay. Oh, man. 18x squared minus 27 well let's just go on and subtract that that's going to be negative 9x squared right should have done that from the very beginning minus 9x squared plus 81 plus 81 i'm having trouble writing i don't know why 
over x to the fourth is equal to zero. We're setting that equal to zero. Well, what's going to make that fractional form equal zero? The numerator. The denominator is not going to contribute to zero at all. It can't be zero, so it's not going to contribute. That's zero only if the numerator is zero. Okay? Now, when the numerator is zero, what we have um, is minus 9x squared plus 81 equals zero. Okay? I'm going to factor out a minus 9. And that leaves me with x squared minus 3. No, minus 9. Sorry. Minus 9 equals zero. I can divide out that minus 9 and be no worse for it because 0 divided by 9 is not. Well, I can also factor this. This will be x plus 3 times x minus 3. So x is either equal to minus 3 or x equal 3. So sure enough, when x is equal to 3, our first derivative is 0. And that's really all we were interested in here. We're not showing the other side of that thing. We're not going over the x equal negative 3. So the first derivative is 0 at that point. Now, here is f of x is equal to f of value of x. We know that function. That's our good old v-shaped function, right? What is the derivative at the minimum, relative minimum? Say again? No, not this time. Because the left hand limit as that derivative is coming in, that derivative is a minus one. This one going up this way is a plus one. And at zero, negative one is never equal to plus one. That one doesn't exist. The derivative doesn't exist. Minus one here, plus one here, there's no value in between. I mean, yeah, zero is in between those, but it's never flat. It's always pointed. It doesn't have a derivative. Okay? Now, over here, f of x is equal to the side x. Okay? Now, oh, man. The relative maximum here, we know that function, is going to be pi has 1. The relative minimum here is going to be negative. Is 3 has pi negative 1. Okay? What we're interested in is what the derivative is at those points. Well, what is the derivative of sine x? Cosine x. And what we want to do is evaluate that cosine x at pi halves, and at negative 3 halves pi. What is cosine of pi halves? Derivative is 0. And what is the derivative at cosine? I mean, what is the value? Cosine of 3 halves pi. That's also zero, okay? So sure enough, these have derivatives of zero. Why? This is a smooth continuous function that is not a smooth. It is continuous, but not smooth. It doesn't have a derivative there. This is a smooth continuous function, so its derivatives are zero at the relative maximum limit. So if you have a smooth continuous function, the, der the derivatives at the Relative minimum or relative maximum are always going to be zero. If you have either a discontinuous function that is not at that point in discontinuity, it has no derivative, or if you have a continuous function that's not smooth at that point of uh, where it's not smooth, it won't have a derivative either. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, I think we've 
beat that to death. There was example one. All right. Oh, here's how they show how to do it. Here's the derivative. flip things around, they've done several things at once, okay, minus 9, okay, minus 9 times minus 3 is positive 27, positive 81 x squared, they factored out the x squared, 9 times 9 is 81. So they've done a couple of things here to you. Okay? Uh, and then the other term here is minus 9x squared times this. That would be minus 27x to the fourth. And this is a plus 18x to the fourth. That would be a minus 9x to the fourth. So they factored out that, they divided out the two. Uh, yeah, they divided it out too, so it gave you x squared. So this also had a minus 9x squared. Factored out the 9, gave you this. You can forget about the 9 if you're setting this equal to, well, they're not doing that yet. Uh, This is just what the derivative winds up being, okay? Let me not take it any further than what they do. At the point 3, 2 then, the value for that derivative is when you plug in a 3, that will give you 3 squared is 9, 9 minus 9 is 0, so it doesn't matter what the rest of it is, that uh, value is that. So, again, they gave you the point where the relative maximum was, and then you plug it in. What we did was set this equal to zero. The nine and the denominator don't contribute. That's what contributes to zero. That zero is either at plus three or minus three. They don't show what's going on over here at minus three and plus three. Uh, that derivative is equal to zero. Okay. Sure. All right. Um, that was the A one. Here's the B one, the absolute value function. At x equals zero, the derivative of f of x does not exist because the following one-sided 
limits do not uh, differ from each other. On the left, your limit is minus, your derivative is minus one. On the right, the limit is, the derivative is plus one. And as you get closer and closer to zero, they don't change. So they don't have the same limit for the right or the left. So therefore, the limit doesn't exist. The derivative doesn't exist. L prime of zero does not exist. L of zero does, but L prime of zero does not. Okay. Now, yeah, the limit from the left is minus one. The limit from the right is plus one, and those two don't ever change. Closer and closer you get to zero, they're still minus a plus one. So there is no agreement of the limit. Now, the derivative of f of x equals sine x is f prime is equal to cosine x. Uh, at the point pi halves one, in the original, in there. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. I'm almost losing. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Just got two more classes to teach you today. All right, Diamond is here. Anyone else come in since I call the roll? What's going on here? Um, at those values, the they they showed you where the relative maximum and minimum were. What we did was actually set that equal. I didn't actually set it equal to this, but where is cosine x equal to zero uh, in that interval from say zero to to, to two pi? Uh, cosine is zero at pi halves and at three halves pi. Okay, so indeed. Those are your derivatives. And they are derivatives that equal to zero horizontal tangent lines because these are smooth continuous curves. Okay. So they did it one way, we kind of did it the other way. The point being your derivatives. Your relative maximum or minimum are always going to occur where either the first derivative is zero or the first derivative does not exist. That's what we're getting at. We haven't got quite gotten there yet, but that's where we're heading. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. Notice in example one that at each relative extrema, the derivative is either zero or doesn't exist. <coughs> Now, just that sampling of three does not say it's true forever. This is saying, yeah, that is going to be true forever. The x values at those special points are called your critical numbers. The x values at those places where either the first derivative is zero or the first derivative that does not exist, those are going to be your critical numbers. Now, still have a problem with the way they're wording this. We'll see this later. Uh, you can have places where either of these or both of them does work, but you still don't have an extreme value. But at each extreme value, these things do exist. We'll get there a little bit later. So these critical numbers are the places where the first derivative is zero, the first derivative doesn't exist. That doesn't mean that every one of these is an extreme value, but we know that every extreme value, those critical numbers, uh, are either the slope of your tangent line is either zero or it doesn't exist. So here's another one. This is called a cusp. The uh, absolute value function was just a point. You know, it, it came down to a point. This is a cusp. It's a curve that comes up here and a curve that goes down here. This curve is approaching a first derivative of positive infinity. This one's coming from a first derivative of negative infinity. So again, those the first derivative does not exist at 
that point. Okay? So that is a critical number, but it does lead to a relative maximum. Okay? On well, this one, the factor of it is zero. Okay? So that is a critical point as well. So the colleague's critical point C, and that's why way back then we were using C for it because they're going to call these critical values C, your various values for C, which means critical values. Okay, these critical numbers. So here's the definition of a critical number. Let F be defined at C. Now, if F is not defined at that critical value, hang it up. That's not going to be a relative maximum or minimum. Okay? If it's not defined there, it's not going to have one. But if uh, let F be defined at C, and if F prime of C is zero, or if F is not differentiable at C, in other words, the derivative does not exist at C, even though the the function is defined there, then C is a critical number for F. So if either its first derivative is zero or the first derivative doesn't exist there, that makes C a critical number. Okay? It doesn't guarantee an extreme value, but it makes it a critical number. Notice the definition above that the critical number C has to be in the domain of F, but C does not have to be in the domain of L prime. That would be this case. All right, so here's the theorem that goes along with that. Relative extrema occur only at the critical numbers. Notice how they worded it. Relative extrema occur only at the critical numbers, where your first derivative is zero, or your first derivative doesn't exist. What that doesn't say is every value where that one of those two conditions hold will be in a relative extrema. But relative extrema will always be at those critical numbers. If F has a relative minimum or relative maximum x equals C, then C is a critical number of F. That's what we call it C. Okay? Critical number of F. Now, what that doesn't say, though, is that every critical number will have a relative maximum or relative minimum. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So, they skipped example two. No, no, they didn't. All right. All right, but before we go any further, there is a blurb on uh, page 168 on Pierre de Fermat. I guess is how you say his name, a French mathematician. Um, lived 1601 to 1665, only 64 years. But uh, for Fermat, who was trained as a lawyer, <laughs> Sorry, folks, y'all awake yet? Okay. Four people listening at home, they had no clue that was coming. All right. He was a lawyer. He wasn't. I mean, he was a great mathematician, but it was more of a hobby to him. He wasn't. His life work was not math. It was being a lawyer. But he loved math, and he loved playing around with math, okay? Um, he made many contributions to analytic geometry, number theory, calculus, and probability. In letters to his friends, which he had friends, I'm sure, in the legal profession too, but those that he wrote uh, to mathematicians, uh, he wrote many of the fundamental ideas of calculus long before Newton or Leibniz, Leibniz either one. Uh, and this theorem, 3.2, that theorem right there has been yuck, uh, attributed to uh, Fermat. He didn't develop calculus, but he... he that was the other two, but he did a lot of the stuff that went into uh, finding that. And by the way, you'll notice in your text, this theorem has one of those, I don't know what you call them, I know they must have a name. I call them a square 
barcode. It's not a barcode, but those things that you can read with your phone. Okay. Second. What? QR code. QR code. Q letter R letter. Okay. QR code. Okay. You know what that Q stand? Q and R stand for? Click something. Okay. A QR code, uh, that little square there that has that, that uh, you can go to that and it'll take you right to uh, LarsonCalculus.com and uh, give you a little more stuff there. All right, so let's do finding extrema on a closed interval. Theorem 3.2 states that the relative extrema of a function can occur only at the critical values for the function. That's where the first root is zero or doesn't exist. Knowing this, you can use the following guidelines to find the extrema on a closed interval. Okay? Find the extrema on a continuous function. That has to be continuous. Can't be piecewise defined. Has to be continuous on this closed interval. Okay, doesn't have to be smooth, but has to be continuous. Close interval A to B, use these steps. Find the critical numbers of F on A to B. How do we find those? What's the good answer? Take a derivative, okay? And what do we look for? The critical numbers. Okay, but how do you find those? Where the first derivative is either Zero, or, zero or not defined. Exactly. If it's anything other than zero or is defined and anything other than zero is not a critical number. So it either got to be zero or not defined. Okay? That's how you find the critical number. And the x that Make that true. Evaluate L for each of those critical numbers in A to B. Okay? Evaluate the function there. That will give you the y value. Evaluate f at each of the endpoints. This is a closed interval, a to b. So since we're looking for that, we have to remember from before your endpoints can be your extreme. Okay. So evaluate at your critical numbers and evaluate at the endpoints. Okay. Um, and the least of those values is your minimum. The greatest is the maximum. Every closed interval will have both a minimum and a maximum. Now we're talking global, okay? And those will be your extremes, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. Let's do example two. Find the extrema of f of x equal 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed on the interval from minus 1 to 2. So what you reckon we'll do first? And it doesn't matter what order. What will you do to look for extrema? Take a derivative. Take a derivative, okay. Sounds like a wiener to me, okay. L prime of x will then be 12x cubed, is that what I heard? Okay. Minus 12x squared. Okay, what are we going to do with that? 7 it equal to 0. Now, at what values would that be equal to 0? Well, what might we do first? Factor. Okay, factor out a 12x squared. And what do we have left? x minus 1 equals 0. Okay? Guess what? That's true either at 12x squared equals 0 or at x minus 1 equals 0. Well, where would it be if 12x squared equals 0? What will be your 0? x equals 0. Okay. Over here, x equals 1. Okay. Now, both of those points, 0 and 1, are in between negative 1 and 2. Right? Okay, so these are two critical points. That's where your first derivative is zero. Is the first derivative undefined anywhere there? 
No, because this is a polynomial function. Polynomial functions are smooth and continuous everywhere. So there's no place where the first derivative is undefined. These are the two values in that interval where the first derivative is zero. And then the other two values we're going to have to consider are The endpoints, negative one and two. So doesn't matter which order you do, which you want to evaluate first. Okay, f of negative one is equal to three negative one four. Okay. Okay. Minus four times negative one. So that would be 3 plus 4. I'm already adding them. Even though I said 3, I wrote 7. Okay. 3 plus 4 equals 7. So f of negative 1 is 7. Everybody agree? Let's plug in negative 1 in there, and you get plus 1, 3 times 1 is 3. Plug in a minus 1 there, you get a negative 1 cubed is negative 1, and negative 4 is plus 4. 3 plus 4 is 7. There's a value. Okay? Which one you want to evaluate the weight evaluate next? Two. Second? Two. two. Okay. Alpha of 2, we're doing the endpoints first. Doesn't matter. What will it be there? Woo! Boy. Sixteen, isn't it? Two times two is four times two times three, yeah. Three times sixteen, right? Minus four times eight. So this will be forty eight minus thirty two equal sixteen. All right, we know two things now. Negative 1 can't be a minimum, a maximum, because negative 2 is greater than that, and 2 can't be a minimum, because negative 1 is less than that. But we still don't know uh, if either of them are extreme values. So what other two do we need to consider? Zero. Alpha of 0. That's going to be hard, isn't it? What? Zero. All right. That one's okay. It wasn't supposed to be hard. Okay. So it's in the running for minimum. It's beat the other two. And the last one would be f of one. And what would that be? Three minus four equal negative one. So guess what? The extrema are the minima and maxima. Okay? The minimum value is at L equal one, negative one, the maximum value is at two. Alpha two is sixteen. Negative 1 on this end, neither minimum or maximum. Alpha of 0 is somewhere in the middle, neither minimum or maximum. Okay? Now. Um, got it. Let's see, I think they may draw this graph. Let's hope they do. I'll erase our chicken scratch, my chicken scratch, okay? And let's see how they do it. Begin by the risk, the differentiating, okay? Take a derivative, okay? That's going to be 12x cubed minus 12x squared. We're going to set it equal to zero. So set that thing equal to zero. Factor out a 12x squared. That leaves that. So x is either equal to a 0 or a 1. So those are our two and only two critical numbers. 
critical values, okay, for x, okay? Now, we also have to include the endpoints. Uh, there are no values where f prime is not defined, so those are the only two critical values on that interval. Okay. The left input, that's the left endpoint at negative one, that value is going to be seven. The first critical value, zero, is going to be zero. So this could be a max, that could be a min, until you get the alpha of one is equal to minus one, that wipes out this being a min. This could be a min, that could still be a max. Alpha of two is equal to 16. That being the max, we need to be minimal. Now let's see if we can draw the curve. Now, here is the curve. Now, I don't know if you recall back from pre calculus algebra. Remember, we talked about in behavior. Sounds familiar. I don't know how you like Now, what that meant was, what happens in the long run if we're very uh, large negative numbers or very large positive numbers? What you consider is your leading term. This term over here, for very large x's, either large negatively or large positively, this one swaps that out. Uh, for very large x's, x to the fourth is going to completely overwhelm x cubed because you're raising a big number, a huge number, to another power. Okay. So we consider only the leading term. Now, with that exponent being even, that means it's either up and up or down and down. Okay, remember this? Okay. Uh, if the leading coefficient is positive, it's up and up. So you know that the that for large negatives and large positives, you expect this function to be increasing without bound. And sure enough, it seems like that's the case. Okay? So the two critical points, that's going to be uh, a point in here and a point down there. Okay? Now this is really hard to see on this scale that that is indeed a relative, relative maximum. No, or is it? No, it isn't. This is decreasing to here, and then it's decreasing afterwards. This is called a, haven't gotten there yet, but it will be called a uh, point of transition, uh, yeah, a transition point, okay? It's decreasing here, levels off to zero, but then picks up and goes decreasing again. How you could tell that is, remember this had a double root, x equals zero, x equals zero, because it was uh, twelve x squared equals zero. X equals zero or x equals zero, that's two roots and when you have an even number of roots for that that means it uh, well we won't go any further than that but it it indicates it comes down here hangs around but then keeps going down if that was a single it would cross okay uh, this hangs around hangs around and then crosses so that is a uh, that is a a critical point, but it's not going to be a relative maximum or minimum. Because it looks like it's going to be a relative minimum here, it looks like a relative maximum there. That's because this first derivative has uh, two possible zero, uh, double zero. This one is clearly just a minimum, okay? A local minimum, but for this function, it's also the absolute minimum. In fact, for the entire function, it's because that keeps going up and that keeps going up. I don't think they'll ever flip around and come back down again. Okay? 
So you're sure enough, that's your minimum. On this interval, that's the maximum. If this had ended, say, right here, then that would have been your maximum, okay? If it had ended anywhere here, whatever on this end would have been. Yeah, one of those two would have been. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. In figure 3.5, notice that the critical number x equals 0 does not yield either a relative minimum or a relative maximum. That's what I was just talking about. They don't really tell you why, they just say it is. This tells you that the converse of theorem 3.2 is not true. Just because every relative maximum, relative minimum will have either a zero derivative or a non-existent derivative, that doesn't mean that the zero derivative or non-existing derivative is guaranteed to be uh, a minimum or maximum. So it goes one way but not the other. In other words, the critical numbers of a function need not produce relative extrema, which is what I've been saying at the very, from the very beginning. All the relative extrema exist at the critical values but they, uh, just because it's a critical number doesn't mean it will be a relative extrema. I can't believe that's the end of the section. They left off example three and four. I'm not sure we're going to have time to do either one of those. Because we are within, what, a minute and a half. All right, let me go on and give you the homework exercises. Uh, did everyone, Diamond, were you here when I passed out the test? No, okay. Anyone else come in after I passed out the test? This is a test on chapter two. It only covers the first five sections. It doesn't have to cover chapter six, uh, section six. By the way, the first two questions are, are pretty much two one, uh, two, one. The next two, three, and four are two, two. Five and six are two, three. Seven and eight are two, four. Nine and ten are two, five. However, that early stuff, they all built on each other, so you could do probably all those with two, four. Or, yeah, maybe not all of them. You know, uh, two, five, you will need that for the last two. Okay, so let me give you homework exercises in 3.1. Do any of the odds 7 through 11, all those odds are at uh, calcchat.com, only 7 is at calcview. Um, 13 or 15, uh, both are at calcchat, neither of them are at calcview. Any of the odds 17 to 21, they're all3 at calcchat, only 17 is at calcview. Do any of the odds 23 through 39, they're all at Calc Chat. 25 is at Calc View. Do either 41 or 43, they're both at Calc Chat. 41 is at Calc View. Do either 45 or 47, they're both at Calc Chat. Neither are at Calc View. Do 49, it's at Calc Chat. Uh, not at Calc View. Do 51, it's a, well, let's see. Let's hold off there. Let's end these at, at 49. We'll pick up the rest of those when we do those next couple of examples. Okay? So we'll do that. And then there'll be a few more we'll add at the end, too. Good deal. All right. So remind me next time, I will go to the slide for 3.2, but I'll go back and do the... Uh, examples three and four that are not on the slide set. Okay. Sorry, did I cheat you out of a not much minute of your tuition dollar? Maybe not. So we'll finish up 3.1 and go on to 3.2.